Hello, Tim Willoughby here with Randy Bueller for the fourth and final quarterfinal here at the World Magic Cup. Are you ready? Because I know that I am. It's time to go and see Scotland versus Italy down in the feature match area. Welcome to this, the fourth and final quarterfinal between Scotland and Team Italy here in the World Magic Cup. Let's meet our teams. Martin Clement. Stephen Murray. Grant Hislop. Team Scotland! Andrea Mengucci. William Pizzi. Marco Camilluzzi. Francesco Bifero. Team Italy! Two teams that really embody the spirit of this tournament, absolutely yes. having a whale of a time, both of them. But things are getting pretty serious now because we're in the elimination stages and we're going to kick things off with the team captain of Scotland, that there, Stephen Murray. This is third World Magic Cup on the team, mm -hmm. third out of four. Um, he's been in a top eight situation before, back at the very first World Magic Cup in Indianapolis. And this time round, he's battling against Italy. And we're calling them the two-headed giant. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is, um, we've got William Pizzi, but also the team um, coach in Francesco Bifero here. And we have a, kind of an interesting matchup here because it's Jess Guy against one of the sort of fairly new decks of the tournament in um, the um, Teamer Megamorph. Team Megamorph deck. Yeah, I mean, the Italians have the Esper Dragon and the Atarka Red that so many other teams have, but their third deck is this Teamer Megamorph. Very interesting uh, development from the super team. They are the last last member standing from the big super team that everyone was expecting big things from coming into this weekend. I feel like that story's yet to be written. We'll see if Italy makes a deep run here or if that super team gets kind of written off as a failed experiment. Now, Randy, you were saying that one of the cards you felt might be very good in this matchup is Mantis Rider. We can already see that there's one in Stephen Murray's hand, along with yep. suitable lands that he's going to be able to get it out there on turn three. Yeah, the news desk was saying that they liked the Teamer Megamorph side of this matchup, but... I think Mantis Rider is is the key card. I like the Jeskai side if there's Mantis Riders flying over all of that ground clutter. We got, got to see the Khans Trilands as the first place for both of these teams. But the first actual threat is another card from Khans and a very powerful one at that in Savage Knuckleblade. Coming down on turn three, a 4-4 four -four with just a whole raft of abilities. It can gain haste, it can pump itself, it can bounce itself, but mostly it can just beat people right up. It does hit harder than the uh, Mantis Rider. Comes out first and is a little bigger. This game could be nice and bloody. So the island coming off polluted delta for Stephen Murray. That also means that he's got both his basics in play so that from right. now on any of his uh, Battle for Zendikar lands will come into play untapped. That potentially pretty relevant here. Both of these decks have the potential to play a little bit of control, but in practice, they can also just present a real threat. And Stephen Murray casts his Mantis Rider, immediately gives it the little jiggle that means that it's going into the red zone with Vigilance, cracking in for three, taking William Pitsy down to 17. Wow, Pitsy's got Collected Company queued up for this turn. Oh, but he doesn't have a land that comes into play untapped, does he? Yeah, a, a lot of copies of Frontier Bivouac, which is great news for Team Italy in terms of getting all of their colors, but not necessarily about getting them on time. Just swings in for four here, no pump, and he's going to play that tapped Frontier Bivouac and can't even play a Cinderglade untapped because he is still currently on just the one basic. And he's going to choose not to play the Rattle Claw Mystic because he'd rather leave up Negate. Yeah, William Pizzi and um, Francesco Bifero, they've been kind of tag-teaming it for the, the entirety of this tournament. Um, you're always allowed a coach, and these two have been kind of working together, coaching one another uh, in the rounds, depending on who's playing and who is um, taking a back seat. And it's worked out great for Italy. They, plus, of course, Marco Camaluzzi, Andrea Mengucci, came into this uh, top eight second seed, which means that there's only one team that they're ever going to have to worry about being on the draw for, potentially very big, given they've got some... Pretty aggressive decks. 
Stephen Murray does not present a negate target. He goes for a morph. And okay, Fiery Impulse is going to dispatch that hidden Dragon Slayer. I was wondering if Pitsy was hoping Fiery Impulse could get to Spell Mastery and take out the Mantis Rider, but not so much. Well, there's another copy of Savage Knuckleblade here, and there's certainly a temptation to cast it and immediately give it haste and say, let's race. We'll find out whether or not Team Italy is looking to get points on the board fast or just keep things a little bit more consistent and, and hold back because they do have some nice responses in hand also. It looks like they're going in stuck into the red zone here. Paste it up. Two-turn clock. I, th I think I like this line. The fact that it does threaten lethal the very next turn means that there's really not that much time for Stephen Murray to do a huge amount about what Italy have got going on here. And there's that Cinderglade coming into play tapped. He's played it, comes into play tapped land on every turn of the game except turn three. Worth remembering, of course, that Scotland and Italy have played already in Constructed in this event. Um, two rounds before the end of the Swiss, Italy did win against um, Scotland. Put Scotland in a tough position where they had to win their last round and hope that Italy won their last round. Everything kind of worked out and now they're playing again. And Sarkhan has come down. Minus three has meant that the first of the two Savage Napical blades have been dealt with. Um, now we'll find out whether or not uh, Stephen Murray is happier to keep his Planeswalker around or his Mantis Rider, because I'm guessing there could be an attack on that Planeswalker in some way, shape, or form soon enough. I suppose there's also the potential for Collected Company here. If you hit a Bounding Crisis, <laughs> then you get to tap down that Mantis Rider, kill Sarkhan for free. There's also the fact that Stephen Murray's at seven. I mean, you probably have to kill Sarkhan, but it's not 100% that you have to kill Sarkhan. I mean, I think the actual perfect would be Collected company, leaving up your Cinderglade <laughs> or your Frontier Bivouac. Hit, hit big Bounding nux. Crisis and a Big Nux. Give it haste. Kill you. That's a good line. All right. Savage Knuckle Blade does attack Sarkin. Yeah. I think this, that this makes the sense. safe line. Yeah, I mean, the Mantis Rider is a four-turn clock. Mantis Rider plus Sarkin is a two-turn clock. So definitely makes a lot of sense to kill Sarkin. I'm just, if you can come up with a line to kill Stephen Murray, that's even better. Murray, of course, had the super tense conclusion to uh, <laughs> the win and in for them in the, the final round of the Swiss yesterday. The final extra turn of the last round of the Swiss. Wild Slash was the draw. Yeah, the burn spells in uh, Murray's deck not necessarily matching up well against three mana four fours. Ultimately, this, this has felt like it's been Scotland versus Pretty much just Savage Knuckle Blades. <laughs> this is super close. Ojatai's Command will be a nice one, getting a little bit of life, potentially getting back that wow. Hidden Dragon Slayer. It doesn't deal with Collected Company, though. Yeah, Collected Company, one of the more powerful cards in the format, and another one of the cards that I think a lot of teams kind of had on their hit list of things they wanted to do between their three decks. Yep. Now, there's only 22 creatures in total in this um, Teemur deck, so it's not as completely guaranteed to hit two great creatures as... Jeez. Um, oh, How about Bounding Crisis Death Miss Raptor? Is that good enough? It's pretty good. And now there's 3, 6, 10 power. So Ojitai's Command is actually enough life, or does the pump ability on the Knuckle Blade make it not enough? Oh, well, you can gain four to go to 11, block the uh, Knuckle Blade. With the, drag with with the Hidden Dragon Slayer. 
in for a leg between. So you're taking six and going to five. You're certainly not happy about the situation that you're in, but happier than scooping up and going to game two. You do also potentially get to use your wild slash at end of turn if they've tapped out to not pump their knuckle blade to get that one fully off the board. Let me see Ojitai's command. Lots of modes on it. Uh, countering creature spells, if you've got time, sometimes nice. Often gets used to get creatures back from the graveyard, gain life or draw cards, though. All the modes on it live. Ooh, Fiery Impulse was the draw step for William Bitsy. This is now a lethal attack. I'll declare no blockers. No blockers. There's the pump. And there's some synchronized magic question. going on. It sounds like uh, Andrea Mengucci has won his game one over Grant Hislop at almost exactly the same time that Stephen Murray has taken this hit from uh, William Pitsy, Team of Megamorph. So in its successive fashion, quickly uh, we see Italy go from, well, all the scores are nil-nil across the board yeah, so to I saw, I saw their get a game up in two of their three start. matches. Yeah, that game was actually pretty close, too, with uh, Stephen Murray. If he gets to untap and hit with Mantis Rider one more time, the Exquisite Firecraft and the Wild Slash would have won in the game. He was pretty close to winning that race, but couldn't do it. But we're going to see some sort more magic soon enough. For now, though, we'll have these messages. In The Art of Magic the Gathering of Zendikar, you can experience the danger and beauty of Zendikar like never before. This lavishly illustrated hardcover book features the award-winning Art of Magic the Gathering and gives you an insider's look at the secrets of Zendikar, its people, continents, and creatures. Available everywhere January 5th. Start on your road to the Pro Tour by playing in a preliminary Pro Tour qualifier. With more than 2,000 locations running events, you're sure to find one near you. Visit magic.wizards.com slash pptq for schedules and information. Hello and welcome back to this, the fourth quarterfinal here at the World Magic Cup. Team Scotland versus Team Italy. Italy currently a game up in two of their matches and we're going to get a chance to see a little bit of the third match on the left of our screen. That's Martin Clement playing Black Red Dragons. On the right, Marco Camaluzzi on Ataka Red. Camaluzzi very happy to have locked up the second seed in this tournament because playing Ataka Red, he really wants to be going first as much as possible in this top eight. And in almost every matchup he will be, if he ends up playing against the first seeds France, that's the only time that he may have to sit back and watch what other people have got going on. But Martin Clement, a lot going on on his side of the board, a 6-6 six, six and a 4-4 four, four hanger back walker, along with Pierre and Kieran Nalar. Each of these players trying to go wide, but ultimately it may be that Clement's able to go the widest in spite of all of those goblin tokens for Marco Camaluzzi. Is this play good? Throw my 6-6 six, six hanger back walker with Pete and Kieran Lar? It seems pretty good. Where where are we? Do we know? Is this in the middle of a Kamaluzzi attack or, or what? Yeah, okay, Kamaluzzi's is just Kamaluzzi's attack step. Presumably that was before blockers. Yeah, because there's quite a few more blockers to work with now. More than that. Has Martin Clement run us out of Thopter tokens? Pretty impressive. Oh, what you doing to us, Mush? So, Mush is his name, right? And he just introduces himself as Mush. It's, it, 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 he doesn't introduce himself that way, but is is his nickname. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so here we go. Many, many thopters to work with. I hear you, both you and Rich seem to be, uh, seem to have adopted Scotland here. Is it the kind of thing where it, when they're doing well, they're English, but if they're getting killed, they're, they're definitely not, not English. Uh, not I, don't, I don't think that. I'm just trying to understand. <laughs> no, I, I, I have a Scottish grandmother, so this is. You come by it honest. Yeah, like this is as close as I get to, to glory. So Martin Clement just figuring out his blocks here. I know a lot of the Scottish players getting together in, in assorted shops up, up north to, um, to watch this match, cheering on the team. So Pierre and Kieran are down, but all of these Thopter tokens have something to say about all these goblins. 
Martin Clement does really need to consider his blocks pretty carefully here. Um, he can't really afford to take too much damage because already on 12. We could very well have a much clearer board in mere moments. Yeah, you just block everything, right? No reason to open up potential damage from become immense. Yeah, you, I mean, we, it, we haven't really seen the combo at any point so far in this top eight, but uh, I mean, there it is. Check, check out Marco's hand. And it looks like there's a gigantic graveyard and enough mana to play yeah. all of it. So it turns out that Wild Slash on Pia and Kieran Nalar was gigantic. If Martin Clement had the ability to respond by throwing a Thopter at whatever target Marco lined up, Martin Clement would be in great shape. As it is, though, isn't he just, he's just dead here, right? Unless he's got an instant. Common Men's plus Teamer Battle Rage could turn any one of those goblins into a uh, seven power no. double striking trampler. Yeah, this is a, this is a heartbreaker for. Oh, Draconic Clement. Roar. He does have an instant. He's even got the dragon. He even got the dragon for the little extra push. Wow, what a crazy game. And Marco has to just go for this, right? I, I should say so, yeah. And I guess with the amount of instant speed removal that uh, Clemens has, this not necessarily a matchup where the combo is as powerful as it might be in in other matchups, but you, you're still going to use it when you get the chance. I mean, he, he has no other way to win this game. I mean, I love the way that Marco played this, right? Killing, killing mom and dad, getting Chandra's parents off the board, so there couldn't be any more Thopters getting thrown around. Makes a lot of sense. And the reality is you're only going to lose your Become Immense here because Teemo Battle Rage is never going to get cast once you realize that the, yeah, the nice target Yeah, but you've kind of lost away. the Teemo Battle Rage, too. I mean, you now have the ability to draw the other half of the combo. So it's going to take a couple turns for Martin Clement to actually win the game. But yeah, Draconic Roar as a response to Become Immense. Reveals a dragon, deals three. Every point counts. Oh, he's going to Battle Rage anyway. Oh, interesting. So this will uh, okay. kill the hanger back. So that's three spells. How many prowess triggers are we at? Right. So four toughness, double strike. So the hanger back actually dies to first strike damage here, which means the abbot is going to survive. No, it's not going to die to first strike damage. No, it still dies to first strike damage, right? Yeah, it still dies to first strike damage. <laughs> Get an extra token, though. Four toughness, but five power. So, first strike damage uh, kills the hanger back. Abbott gets to survive till next turn. It's the important part. Uh, and now he really has run us out of Thopter tokens. I take five, Soon enough, uh, there will be some Thopter tokens that are no longer needed. Right, yeah, a little bit of trample from uh, the team of Battle Rage also. So, there will be five damage going on to Clement and Clement there. He does drop to seven. But now Marco is hellbent. No cards in hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All that Martin's got is all of these Thopters are holding out burst, uh, Thunderbreak region, and uh, is that a Ruinous Path? It now? is a Ruinous Path. I think it's actually time to just, yeah, Ruinous Path. Down goes Abbott with the Awaken. Getcha. The full Ruinous Path. And you swing with most of these, right? I think. With no cards in hand, I think you could make the case for swinging with all of them. I guess at 16, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. He's got, he's got you, lethal you, with you his turn fires next turn. You turn things down to it being a one-turn yeah. clock. All right, Michael Camel, let's see what you got. Not a whole lot. Martin wow. Clement picks it up. He picks up his first game. That the first game win for Martin for uh, Scotland in the series. All of these matches now in going to game two. Um, 
currently Italy leads in the match between Andrea Mengucci and Grant Hislop. Italy leads in the match between uh, William Pizzi and Stephen Murray. But Martin Clement of Scotland, he's one up against their team captain, Marco Camaluzzi. And we're going to get a chance to look in on uh, Grant Hislop playing Abzan Agro <coughs> against Andrea Mengucci right now. Who's, who's now playing Esper Control instead of Esper <coughs> Dragons? That sure looks like infinite obliteration for Dragonlord Ojitai. And in the meantime, we got Grant going through, just figuring out exactly what's going on with Andrea Mangucci's deck post sideboard. Uh, I mean, after the, the four copies of Dragonlord Ojitai are gone, the number of ways that um, Mangucci has a win in the game diminish substantially and become a lot easier to deal with. It's a couple Silumgars, right? He has two copies of Silumgar. I mean, you can ultimate Jace and go for it that way. After sideboard, he could have some more creatures. So he could have uh, Tassiga, he could have Monster Mentors and Arishin Clerics. We obviously, we don't know exactly how he sideboarded, though Grant does. <laughs> True. Good. Ray Doyle there uh, sat with Grant Hislop, uh, just getting a feel for exactly what's going on in this matchup, providing some help when appropriate. And Stephen Murray also getting a feel for what's going on. Of course, must be a little daunting playing uh, Abzan against Andrea Mengucci. That basically the deck that Mengucci has been playing, and indeed Kamaluzzi has been playing to great success all year. Yeah, but there's a player that knows what's going on. It's this guy resolving painful truths, and that's Andrea Mengucci casting it for the full three cards. He's got a Jace in play, which may be one of his win conditions at this point. <laughs> Pretty full grip, post-truths. Three copies of Dig Through Time. Cool. Yeah, settle in. Okay. This game might take a little bit of time. It's not necessarily going to be that Grant Hislop's going to have an easy ride to actually finish this game. He does have a painful truth of his own. He's got a couple Planeswalkers, too. Andrea's hand is a little soft to Planeswalkers. <coughs> Falthong Invocation can't deal with him. Now a perfect time to resolve one. He goes with yeah. Soren. I'm not sure he had the double white for Gideon. Oh, you're right there, yeah. And so he makes a vampire token immediately. Um, in future turns, he may well find himself giving his creatures plus one power and lifelink once he's got some more creatures on the board. Um, the minus six ability actually against Esper Dragons, potentially <laughs> a real pain in the neck because they yeah. don't have very many dragons to start with. And sooner or later, if you're having to sacrifice one doing your upkeep, you just you run out of creatures. Yeah, Jace's ultimate is the reason that's not just lethal. There was a window after Soren was printed and before Vrin's Prodigy entered these decks where you could legitimately win the game with just Soren Emblem. Yeah, most ultimates we kind of think of as winning the game. Soren's <laughs> one a little bit more nuanced. Andrea Mangucci here just calmly flips his planeswalker. Duress now, meaning that either that painful truths or Gideon are going to go away. That's a big duress. That's off, that was off the top, too. I feel like Grant would rather have stuck at Gideon last turn. Then the Soren, but man, it didn't let him. Oh, he may still get a chance. Okay, I was wondering which Andrea was going to take there. I mean, they're both super juicy duress targets. Oh, does he get to flash back the duress with Jace though, and get the other one now? I believe so. Yeah. I wow. Mean, what and, a top until deck. that point, I was looking at him thinking, well, plus one on Jace isn't no, terrible yeah, here. Take but them both. Yeah, leave leave wow. Grant with just the. The lone vampire and Soren in, in play. Now the vampire does get to kill Jace, but Andrea's got another one in his hand. Or he had another one in his hand. I guess he discarded that. And Surge of Righteousness says, actually, no, Jace is going to hang around. Fair enough. That vampire, amongst other things, was a black or red creature that was attacking or blocking. <coughs> and Andrea Mangucci gains a couple of life and virtually clears 
All the threats out of Grant, his slops board. Yeah, I was a little bit surprised that Andre had discarded Jace to Jace, uh, but Surge of Righteousness explains everything. All, and all of a sudden, Andre Mangucci is just in great shape. He's already at dig through time. Okay. Two mana. Dig. I guess he's what he's exiling six and leaving exactly painful truth right. in his graveyard. Yeah, um, it seems like flashing back painful truths at some point is going to be pretty solid. Yeah, I mean the infinite in, the infinite obliteration from Grant Hislop is definitely going to cramp Andreas' style. That said, if he gets control of the game, he's still going to be able to win it. Yeah, I mean, there are them that would suggest that once Esper Dragon starts going, it's got style to spare. So it may well be that he's able to find a way of getting this going. Andrea, I believe, took Silumgar Scorn and Flooded Strand. And I think this was main phase dig because he really wanted to play a land. I mean, hitting land drops certainly one of the important pieces in right. terms of what um, any deck needs to do, but especially these control decks because I mean, with that many copies of Dig Through Time, you may just say, oh, well, I want to cast a few of them a little early. I don't want to have to delve every time. Yeah, three digs in his hand makes this line make a lot more sense too. I believe he did still, he does have a Shambling Vent in his hand, but went for the Flooded Strand so that he can potentially play a Silumgar score. I mean, Shambling Vent is another path to victory. It's it's a pretty long path. True, true story. So Mengu did take Selimgar Scorn off that dig through time, but that's another place where the infinite obliteration is cramping his style. Selimgar Scorn is actually only a four spike. Yeah, and and, and that, if if no other reason, is a, is a great reason that sort of taking the dragon was going to be a good choice. Wouldn't the first tree coming down here? Can't really still go score on that one right now. Valentine invocation. Yeah. Huh? Grant chose to make the vampire first, so the warden could not be killed by one Falcon invocation. Grant Hislop is a game down here, so he's going to have to win back to back against this uh, Esper Dragon's deck. Dragon Lord Silumgar. Yeah, that was a nice draw. <laughs> yeah, now a large amount of the spells in Andrea Mengucci's deck get substantially better, including that Foul Tongue invocation that you can see. More was on the way. So they got the police in as well. Anecdotes coming from the Scottish team here. Both of these teams of the entire tournament just been having a blast the whole time yeah, they've been these, playing. These seem like some fun guys to hang out with for sure. Family event comes into play tapped, so Mangu can't play Silumgar this turn. He can, which means that Jace is vulnerable to an attack, so I think this may be Jace giving up his life for a flashback. In flashback, Valtong, kill your warden. Feels pretty good to me from Italy's perspective. Well, yeah, they know that this game is going to go pretty long. So. Well, the other thing this means is that uh, Grant will tick up Soren and Dragonlord Silmgar will be in perfect position to steal Soren and then have him commit suicide to make a vampire next turn. Yeah, that's a nice spot to be in. Wow, and they get to leave up Silmgar Scorn. It will be the fully foreboding Silmgar Scorn where you reveal the Silmgar you're uh. just about to cast as well. Yeah, that requires Grant to top deck something worth countering, though. Yeah, at the moment, Sorum Solemn Visitor is basically all that Grant Hislop has going on. And the fact that he's hamstrung what uh, Mengucci's deck can do thanks to an early infamous obliteration on Dragon Lord Ojitai. He's going to decline to take up Sorum. He's worried about Dragon Lord Zilumgar. It's funny, he didn't forget that Planeswalker. He just deliberately chose to put Soren in a state where Silumgar couldn't just kill him. Of course, that does mean that Shambling Vent could just swing in and do so anyway. Sure. 
But no, heads up, heads up play there from Grant Hislop. I like it. Is he on land, land, land? Sorry. Yeah, he is. Six lands in play. Couple more in hand. Go. This not the draw that Scotland was looking for. Sorry. Looks like there might be an Abzan charm going on. <laughs> I'm not sure I like this trade though from uh, from the Scottish perspective. Dig through time versus Abzan charm. Yeah, it's certainly more satisfying responding uh, the other way around. <laughs> Italy gets the best two of seven. Scotland gets the best two of two. And has to pay two life for I mean, it. That said, Grant did play it correctly, I think. Oh, he yeah, sat yeah. on his abjan charm and waited for, for Mengu to tap out. But. And Menguchi with another Jace here. Just enough cards in the graveyard that as and when he needs to activate that Jace, it will flip into being a Planeswalker. And here a good draw in Den Protector. Let's see whether or not it resolves. I think he used the Silumgar score on that. Revealing, yep, there is Silumgar. Silumgar's score right now. Kind of a dangerous proposition in Andre Mangucci's deck because he only has two dragons left in his deck with which to keep it uh, as a full on counter spell. When you don't have a dragon in your hand, it doesn't really do too much. Duress? Well, there's good news and bad news. Mostly good news. <laughs> Yeah, there's definitely times that you miss on a duress in this sort of a matchup, and it's much scarier because they've just got creature, creature, creature. Yeah. Right now, though, I'm pretty sure that whichever creatures Grant Hislop draws, he's going to have to have a very good reason not to try and play more or less immediately. Another land off the top for Grant Hislop. Rough wow. time here for Scotland. Mangucci could have used Jace to flashback dig through time, but eh, we'll get to that later. Got one in my hand anyway. Just take it up. A, I think there's a painful truth still in the graveyard too. There is indeed, yeah. This is the part where Grant Hislop's going to be looking over to see if his teammates are winning. Yes. Yeah, I think that would be fair. Mangucci up a game here, so this would be a, a full match for Italy barring a very surprising next couple of turns. It would also mean that for one of your other matches, you had a Pro Tour Top 8 that's providing advice. True. Though I have noticed, actually, that um, a, a fair amount of the time, certainly Kamaluzzi quite enjoys just going and watching. And, yeah, he, of course, he will provide advice, but it's, he, he just thinks it's super fun <laughs> having, having a team that he can go and watch them play and be confident that he knows that they're all good players and they can do their thing. I think Gucci just discarded Dragonlord's prerogative. It's the worst card in my hand. Yeah, th there's times that you, you can... You don't need to look at the wall to know there's some writing on it. <laughs> worst card in his hand yeah. is six mana draw four. It's, it's particularly brutal when on the other side of the table, Grant Hislop's like, I would draw four in a heartbeat. This was all the plan to not let me help <laughs> my friends. <laughs> Dragging this game, long, long, long. I'm sorry that I'm making you work for it. <laughs> <laughs> Mengucci there, lambasting Team Scotland for saying, why are you making it so when I draw all these cards, I can't find anything to win with? Sincerest apologies cool. from the Scots. Well, apologies, I'm not sure how sincere <laughs> they are. This card. Crux of fate, not good enough. Is Shambling Vent going to start attacking? Well, to, to a point, you don't really want Jace to be... No, Jace ultimate is, I believe, Andrea's plan here. Here's two shambling vents coming at Jace. God, look at that hand. 
Well, he can only deal with one of them. Well, he can block one and foul tongue the other. Can't let Jace get hit. Sure. Got plans for all that loyalty. <laughs> Got to win a game somehow. Jace up to nine. It's not very often that you get a chance to see a Jace emblem in action. This is going to be kind of exciting. Quick update on our second table. Uh, Stephen Murray, the Scottish team captain, he has managed to level things off against William uh -huh. Pitsy. So that's 1-1 one, one there. Hope lives for Scotland. And here's Tassiga. Yeah, right. Hmm. Here's an opportunity to delve some cards and then see Selimgar score. Yeah. So I don't know. Maybe Andrea wants to steal it with Selimgar. No, he's going to keep Selimgar in his hand. I mean, as long as he's got more counter magic in hand, he's going to want to keep. Um, he's going to want to keep having. Uh, Slumgar in hand. But yep. we have just heard an update. Scotland, you'll be pleased to hear that Martin Clement has won his match against wow. Italian team captain uh, Marco Camaluzzi. Scotland currently leads this series one game to zero. They just need to eke out one or other of these two matches. Currently, Grant Hislop looking in slightly <laughs> tough spot. However, it's 1 1 in the middle. And we will be bringing you all of that deciding yeah, game I mean, after this. Manguchi's going to win this, and then it's going to be all on that game three. That's how this plays out. And if you think that there's a little bit of banter when it's like one or two <laughs> in, uh, Scottish players playing against one or two Italian players, we're going to have a four and four potentially if that matchup ends up happening. Gideon coming down here for Grant Hislop. There's still two scorns in. Menku's hand, yeah. I mean, there's also an utter end. <coughs> there's also the temptation to wait and then ultimate Jace and then start casting spells. Yeah, I can I can imagine that. He already counted Grant's library once. I believe the count was seven spells worth. Yeah, you don't you don't need to actually count the numbers. You just count in fives, right? Right, right. Because as but, yeah. soon as Jace gets its emblem, you say whenever you cast a spell, target opponent puts the top five cards of his library in their graveyard. But Silumgar Scorn was used for Gideon. Andrea not interested in having to deal with a token. And yeah, he ticked date Jace up where he can make an emblem and keep Jace around. Here we go. Telepath unbound indeed. Conveniently, the judges... They saw that one coming over the last however many turns, dug out an emblem for us. I thought it was Andrea reaching for his own deck box. I think he carries one around with him. It's a nice emblem to have. Okay. Is this threat going to stick, says Grant Hislop. <laughs> Andrea Mangucci says, I have every incentive to play lots of spells to make yeah. sure that that doesn't happen. He's down to one Silimgar scorn, so I think Utter End or Languish is going to be the answer to... Anna Fenza. Mill five. So it begins. Now, the really sad thing is when you've drawn this many lands, the things that you're <laughs> milling, <laughs> all the more likely to be non-lands. Wouldn't the first tree off the top? Yes. Sure. Five more down. I wonder, given how many cards Andrea Mangucci had drawn, mm -hmm. if Martin Clement had just said, I'm not going to play any more spells, I'm not going to put any permanents on the board or give you anything to counter, how many spells there are in Andrea Mangucci's deck that he can use to mill with? There's still Foul Tongue Invocation and Dig Through Time. There's, there's, there's one Dig Through Time left. I guess you get to start flashing back spells as well. Oh, yeah. Right. 
it's a pretty controversial line, but at this point, I think that Scotland would take a controversial <laughs> line over no line at all. Wow, this last game is going to be intense. Yeah. Scotland up a match. Italy in great position to win this match. It seems to me like Stephen Murray game threes are things that we just want to keep on camera a lot of the time. Yeah, it's the two, uh, it's that deck, that third deck slot too. Yeah. Jeskai versus Teamer Megamorph. Ah, uh, this one. Ah, so, 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 so. And Jace, where is, where is gone? Oh, what's going on? He flashed back the dig through time, but accidentally put it in his graveyard instead of exile. Ah, okay. Yeah, Meng Menguchi's trying to go for the perfect one where he manages to mill out Hislop and just casually draw almost his entire deck at the same time. Yes. He's probably seen it all by now. It's the fourth dig through time he's resolved. He's put, <laughs> he's put 20 on the bottom. I think there may have been a fetch or two somewhere in the middle there that may have shuffled them up, but probably true. Yeah, build it the scorn and then move it to the Ah, Tassiker. In from the sideboard. A creature that can attack. Or... What, what is this magic that you speak or of? Or trigger a mill five. five. Jace, mill five. One card left. Yeah, Valtong Invocation <laughs> targeting you. And there's the handshake, a smile, because we have one very, very big game ahead of us now. Every seat in the house. The cameras move to the middle table. Looking on as Stephen Murray playing against William Pitsy. The players move to the middle table. Here's the jostling to see who gets the, the good seat where they can <laughs> see what's going on and who's kind of at the back in the bleachers. I'm Martin Clement looking pleased with himself. He did. He managed to get the win. That means that this match matters. And each player drawing their opening hands. Let's see what we got. Yeah, Scotland has practice. That's, his, that's the same lineup they had yesterday. They earned this spot in the, on the last extra turn of the last round of the Swiss yesterday. So we have a Jace that can't be cast and a few other bits and pieces in hand for... Um, Stephen Murray, Savage and Knuckleblade and Collected Company plus lands here for William Pitsy. Neither of these sevens mm. super exciting, but I think of the two, the one that I'd be more likely to keep would be the one for Italy. It looks like Stephen Murray has sent back his hand. Yep. <laughs> and it will be Italy that's on the play for this. Uh, Indeed. Which I guess signals that Italy has kept William Bitsy and Italy synonymous at this point because the whole of Team Italy, I'm sure, having a say in a decision like a, a keep. This tournament's great. We see the flag there on the table for Italy. All these teams, they do have the flags on the table just to sort of remind everyone which country they're representing and also remind themselves that when you make that slightly sketchy keep, you're not just doing it for yourself, you're doing it for your entire country. A reminder that after this game, we will have our lunch break before semi-finals, and in that lunch break, more previews from Oath of the Gate Watch. We've seen some oh, very right. exciting cards previewed already, and you know that set's all about teamwork as well. So kind of appropriate right around the time of the World Magic Cup. This hand looks pretty good. We got a Mantis Rider. We got a couple of lands. Gideon's Two there. Lands. I mean, yeah, I think you keep it. He really wants to draw a third land before he gets to. Yeah, turn the three. scry is going to be big here. Really hoping to see an appropriate land that means that he can cast Mantis Rider if he's keeping this hand. Here's the scry. To the bottom. Straight to the bottom. That tells us plenty. And Frontier Bivouac kicks things off in this deciding planes game. Planes does not help. Second basic planes is not going to help cast Mantis Rider. Shuman Reef to begin.
You can see the Pitsy. Well, he doesn't have very many spells in his hand. The spells that he has are very high impact. And, and, and a couple lands are coming to play untapped, too, where he can go turn three Knuckle Blade into turn four Collected Company. That's the plan. Is it Jeskai Charm for... That was Steven? a Jeskai Charm. So... As yet uncastable. He has. He can play an Arc Lightning, which is not capable of killing Savage Knuckle Blade. He needs mana. Blue or red mana right here. Well, that's another Mantis Rider. Second Mantis Rider. Oof. Yeah, these decks both have some mana base concessions to the format. That is kind of how Unified Standard works. Where are you going to deal out your fetch lands? What are you going to do with your third deck after you put all the fetch lands in the other two? As if it wasn't clear enough from the board state with just Savage Knuckleblade as the lone creature. Stephen Murray is in rough spot here as he's not been able to deploy the two copies of Mantis Rider now in his hand. And a pass. Oh, third basic planes? He only plays three basic planes. And there they That's all are. That's all three of them. This does now mean that Gideon can come down. But we're likely to see a collected company from uh, Team Italy shortly enough. I think you wait for, you wait for the ally token though, right? Yes, I think so. Bounding Graces might be tapping it, for example. Absolutely. Getting the knight ally on the board there. Yeah, the we might need to get the right, <laughs> the right knight there. That one's got Vigilance, and I'm pretty sure that the, the knight allies that come along do not huh. have. And there is the Bounding Graces at the end of turn. It's not, not even a collected company. company. That's interesting. I mean, this, this allows uh, this guarantees to play the clean shot at Gideon. I think I, I like this decision. This is a new token, isn't it? Yeah, so we've got a straightforward attack from Savage Knuck Knuckleblade on Gideon and an attack from Bounding Crisis and potentially even a few more players here from Team Italy. It was Italy that let Scotland into this top eight. 3 0 their group so that Scotland could sneak in with a 1-2 and two mark in pool play yesterday afternoon. Italy got the seed they wanted. They got, yeah, they, they got to play, f they're going to get to play first in almost every match in this top eight, unless they play France at some point. Yeah. Here's a collected company. Main phase collected company. <laughs> wow. There was a creature in there, but it was a cyborged Surak, and he costs too much <laughs> to be able to put into play. Swing and a miss with the Collected Company. Now, is that enough to let Scotland back into this? Maybe, maybe. An island or a mountain is still where yeah, Scotland wants to be on this draw. Well. Probably a mountain, I would yeah, I'm guess. Oh, Polluted Delta. I, I'm moving, so I Good enough. I can get an island, so now all the Jeskai colored spells are turned on. A good few years ago when Scotland qualified for the Football World Cup, um, their theme song by Delamitri was Don't Come Home Too Soon. And that's exactly <laughs> what I'm sure that everyone back home in Scotland is going to be hoping for their Scotland team. They're like, just, just keep on going a little bit more, boys. We, we want to see you in, in the semi-final, in the final. The Delta's down. Yeah, it's not immediately obvious how to play this. Savage Knuckle Blade is gigantic. And there's a temptation to try to get Mantis Riders down. Maybe, but I mean, what did you, there's no way Stephen Murray can turn this into a race. He's gonna have to deal with Savage Knuckle Blade somehow. Is it a double block? Does he take a turn to Arc Lightning the Krasis? I mean, the tough thing with a double block is that there is that pump ability on, on yeah, um, that, the knuckle blade. So as a 6-6, six, six, even a double block is not going to be good enough. Jeskai Charm can send it away temporarily. Maybe that's the line. But then it comes back out with haste again. 
Yeah, I mean, this is the reason that Savage Knuckleblade is a card that I was talking to Ian Duke about this. He said that R&D were a little surprised that initially it didn't see more play in standard. And I think that ultimately it was just that there wasn't quite the right support network. But as an individual card, it is spectacularly powerful. Prairie Stream is the land that came out from Polluted Delta. All those basic planes doing work. And it is the Mantis Rider. A point there taken by Stephen Murray off his uh, Sheevan Reef. And, you know, it's got Vigilance, it's got Haste. You might as well attack with it. Points on the board and all that. Oof, immediately a rending volley from William Pitsy. Wow. A tough time here for Team Scotland in this deciding game of their match in the quarterfinals here against Italy. They have played Italy already in the Swiss. That one didn't go too well for them either. They were able to make it into the top eight regardless, but they are going to need to draw pretty well in the next few turns if they're going to turn this body around. Lumbering Falls comes along to join the attacking team. Lumbers into the red zone. We'll go with that. So this, this night ally, ally somewhat daunted by the fact that every creature that's coming in is, is bigger than it is. A chump block there on the uh, Savage Knuckleblade and six damage coming through, putting Stephen Murray on just five life, facing lethal next turn in a variety of different ways. There's another copy of Gideon. Can't really do two things, though. His mana only lets him do one thing this turn. Team Scotland trying to figure it out. And in the meantime, the whole of Team Italy kind of doing the same thing. They've seen the deck list, so they're trying to figure out what combination of cards they need to worry about here. A little smile from Stephen Murray as he casts his Mantis Rider and gets a, a cheeky hit in. Takes a point to do so. Passes things back. Planes trying to look threatening. <laughs> I don't think William Bitsy's buying it. Of all the planes to look threatening, those white bordered planes are not <laughs> the ones. At least some pointy mirrored in planes or something. Some Euroland sunflowers, but no. Big attacks here coming from the Team Omega Morph deck in the hands of William Pitsy for Team Italy. A block from Stephen Murray, but there's the handshake. And <laughs> we could just about hear the, uh, the bellow from Team Italy in the soundproof booth the other side of the uh, arena. Uh, congratulations to Team Italy. They advance to the semi-finals. Uh, commiserations to Scotland, but a great job making it into the top eight. We'll be seeing all four of them at Pro Tour Atlanta soon enough. But that is the end of our quarterfinals. Tim Willoughby here with Randy Bueller. We've had a blast showing you them. We're going to break for lunch now, but you're going to get a chance oh, to Gate find Watch out a little time. bit. Oh, the Gatewatch. We'll hand you over to the desk now. All right, thanks very much to Tim Willoughby and Randy Bueller there putting a bow on the quarterfinals. Rich Hagen alongside Ian Duke here at the desk. If you haven't been with us all, all morning, or in some cases all afternoon or all evening, depending where you are uh, around the world, let's recap what we've seen in our four quarterfinals, Ian. You started off in the booth down there in the trenches, and we began, if we take a look at our top eight bracket, with the defending champions, Denmark. They came in, we began the day with the possibility that you would get a repeat winner in Denmark, the possibility of a repeat winner in France. What happened in that first quarter final, Liam? Denmark against Thailand. Well, certainly I think Denmark was everyone's expected favorite going to this matchup with big names like Martin Dang and Martin Mueller. But uh, it actually turned out to be quite an upset with Thailand coming out on top there. It all came down to that final game. And uh, Thailand emerges to the semifinals, so excellent for them. Yeah, Virapat Cyril Vorical, the captain for Team Thailand, and uh, you commented both 
in the booth and back here at the news desk about a critical moment where ultimately it hinged on someone doing exactly nothing. That's right. Uh, our, the Thai player, uh, Chum, yep. he had uh, curved out on offense of the foremost into Soren Solemn Visitor against the Natarka Red deck. At 19 life, it was really appealing play to just plus one that Soren attack for five, gain five life. Martin Dang, though, was sitting on Atarka's command to prevent that life gain and deal three damage, which would knock his opponent down to 16, 16. and he had enough spells in his hand to actually finish the game the following turn with an Abbot of Carol Keep. Right, would have been, become incredibly immense. So it all came down to that moment, and uh, the Thai player just chose to sit back on Anafenza, wisely so, and that won him the game there. So really, really impressive stuff yeah. from Thailand. Yeah, Chom Pazipachaya uh, took out that one, and that means that the defending champions are gone, they're eliminated. So, quarterfinal two saw the two real big guns left in the competition. It was France, the number one seed, against Japan, the eight. Now, although they were the eight seed, they had a two-time player of the year in Yu Watanabe. They had a six-time Pro Tour top eight and Hall of Famer in Kenji Samura, a Pro Tour finalist, Demiochi Tamada. Uh, and in the end, what happened there, Ian? Yeah, so two big name teams for sure. I think no one would be surprised to see either of these teams advance deep into this top eight bracket. Um, but in the end, it was actually a, a little bit of an upset uh, for Japan, where they lost mm -hmm. uh, one of their key matches, Kenji Samura playing uh, Abzan Rally against the Natarka Red Deck. Normally a favorable matchup for Kenji in that position, but he stumbled a little bit in game three, ended up losing that one. That was enough to tip the scales, and France emerged as the victor, yeah. moving on to the semifinals. So that means our first semifinal this afternoon will be the Pierre Dajon led team of France alongside Arno Sume and Hichem Chijidi. They are the three players. You've got uh, Fafi Benaribi as the coach uh, for France. France will face Thailand in semi final one. That's coming up in about 20 minutes from now. After after our Oath of Gatewatch preview and the, a round of our coverage favorite moments throughout the year. So the plenty still to come in our lunch break. But then we got quarterfinal three. So we went to the bottom part of the bracket and we had the rock solid Austrians. This was Valentin Mackel, Nicholas Eigner, Christoph Alcantara, who was uh, actually uh, the coach and then Sebastian Fiala Ibitz, and they were up against one of the great stories. Guatemala showed great skill and nerve and daring navigating their way through all the formats across two days to make it in to the top eight. Um, and in, in the end, this one, um, we saw finally the they say the rock solid Austrians winning out. Yeah, ultimately it was the, the experience of the Austrians um, overpowering the, the awesome spirit that the Guatemalan team had here and uh, Austria will move on to the semifinals. That said, where Guatemala will move on to is the next Pro Tour. Christopher Virila already has 17th place in his first ever Pro Tour. The rest of the team will join him uh, there in Atlanta, so we'll see all four of them in February in individual play, and it's a pretty exciting time for Guatemala Magic, so brilliant job by them. But their run ends in the quarters. Austria come back this afternoon, and they will face it's Italy. So Italy played Scotland in our last quarterfinal. You've just seen it there. Uh, and Ian, after the utter heroics of late last night um, with the Scotland match, um, in this time around, Stephen Murray with his Jess Guy deck. Mantis Rider is great, but generally when it's on the board, not stuck in hand with not the three colors you need. That's right, yeah. A little bit of a rough mana situation for Team Scotland there. And ultimately, they came up short with that Jess Guy deck. But awesome run for them. And uh, good luck to them at the Pro Tour. Yeah, so uh, we see France, Thailand, they will be up first, then we will move to Austria against Italy, and that wraps up our coverage of the quarterfinals. Well, this has been the Oath of the Gatewatch kickoff weekend here in Barcelona. We know that that great new set is well on the way. Ian came in on Friday to talk to us about some cards. We'll recap those yep. in a couple of minutes. Also, Gavin Verhey joined us yesterday to talk about more cards. And Ian, you're back with more. So, without further ado, it's time for part three of our Oath of the Gate Watch preview.